Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. And Mike, I do have to mention this because we have to pay the bills around here some way, somehow, right? Please like, subscribe, comment on the videos. When you guys did that the other day, that video was ranked one of our highest Ask Mikes of all time. So please help us out. If you like the show, like the video, hit the subscribe button and even comment. I don't care what you comment. You can say burritos are my favorite food, whatever. It doesn't have to be about the video. Just please let us know that you are out there and watching. Also, speaking of people who watch the show, I ran into some awesome, awesome fans of Ask Mike the other day, Mike. One at the Broil Center who told me his name is Carter. He was awesome and he said he watches every single week. So I want okay. to shout out to Carter. And then I was at Local Lime over in Rogers, if you know where that is by the Pinnacle shopping area. And I was at Local Lime and the bartender came up to me and he goes, I just want to let you know, um, I watch Ask Mike every week and I love it. And so Noah, shout out to you for watching every <laughs> single week. He loves it. He said, Mike, I love your perspective on stuff. And, and I love that you guys can banter with each other. And even when we argue, he likes that too. So there you go. Thanks, Noah, for watching. We appreciate you guys. But let's jump in to why you guys are here. And that's answering questions. Our first question is from Hog Redneck who asks, are we back where we were a year ago with the defense dominating preseason scrimmages because the QB has no time to find his receivers? Sam Pittman is starting to sound a lot like he did last year. Okay, he's re referring, I guess, to this press conference after the scrimmage last week, which was what, Thursday? Thursday, yep. Okay. And it did. <clears throat> it sounded, even I thought, okay, this sounds a little bit like what was going on at the end of uh, August camp last year when they, they don't give real statistics, just kind of sign up some, some generalized statements about so-and-so so did this or that, but really talking about the defense dominated and he said some things about his little disappointing the offense. Taylor Green kind of went regressed a little bit, blah, 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 blah. And the only way I can describe this or explain this is to say that most people in the public eye <clears throat> are aware that they te need to do a little PR from time to time. Ta Sam Pittman's kind of an anti-PR guy. <laughs> He's the only guy I ever know, I've ever been around, that makes things seem a little worse than they are. I don't know what that is, whether he feels like he just has to do that or whatever. Because when a lot of the people that were at that scrimmage started digging around and talking to Kyle, who was keeping the stats and checking on certain things, they found out it wasn't nearly as bad as it sounded. Like, for instance, there were eight interceptions. Yeah. But that includes the first unit, the second unit, the third unit four different quarterbacks throwing, and I think they've concluded that Taylor Green might have thrown one of those interceptions. Yeah, it looks like when you infer things from those stats, when you look at who, who actually caught those interceptions, right, four of them were walk-ons. Yes. So that says to me right away, wait a second, this yeah. isn't as bad as it seems. And maybe the one interception went off a receiver's hands and it kind of wasn't. Yeah, the first three, Sam said, were tip balls. Tip yeah. balls. So there was that. And then you have to take in also into consideration that their top two wide receivers set, set out. They've been out both of those, I think. Yes, they have. Yeah, Andrew Armstrong Broden, and, and Broden Bro didn't Bro play. Tyrone Broden. Yeah. And they're not seriously injured. They've just got little things, and I think Sam Pittman held them out. Didn't mean not anything happened because I know, once again, we saw Monte Harrison. They showed video of him making this catch. He was wide open. He scored. So it wasn't just terrible. Um, there were just, I think he was talking, he's, he's talking about the overall flow of the thing and the way it happened and all of that. The other thing I would say is, and this is just my opinion, but based on what I've seen so far and what I've heard and what has been said in these pressers from players and coaches, I think the defense was pretty good last year, got frustrated at the end, and we talked about that, what mm -hmm. happened to them, yeah. got a little frustrated by how bad the offense was. But I think the defense is markedly better this year. Mm -hmm. I think that they've, they've got talent. They've got depth. That secondary is just, they just rotate guys in and out. And they're making plays and we see it happen over and over. Yeah. Um, somebody's open, it looks like they got a catch and then somebody reaches in and knocks that ball away. I think these guys are very aggressive. I think he, Sam did complain about the tackling some, but then I looked at some of the video and the running backs were doing a great job. I mean, that's always the problem. 
when you pick out something to criticize in a scrimmage, the tackling wasn't good. But maybe the tackling wasn't good because the guy running with the ball was really exactly, good. Exactly, yeah. So you'd have to actually see it, which none of us do, which brings us to fans who watch this having not seen a scrimmage and come to these conclusions. So my question is, should Sam Pittman be more PR conscious in light of last year? Should he have said, well, you know, this was pretty good. I'll make it sound even a little better than it was, or at least I won't play it up uh, down a little bit, but he didn't. And I'm going to get into why I think that happened in response to another question here in a minute. But the fact is, I think based on what I've read, what I, what I concluded, what people said, I don't think this scrimmage was anywhere near as bad as, as he sort of made it sound. It, it, when I listened to that press conference, and I'll admit it, I did the same thing as every fan did. I went, ooh, this does not yeah, sound no, good. I'm, but that doesn't help you when you don't see the scrimmage yourself, right? right? It doesn't help you. And so I agree with you. It's kind of this balance of does Sam tell the truth or, or does he make it seem worse than it was? Because mostly uh, you would think a coach would make it sound better. Better. That's what I would. <laughs> I, I absolutely admitted that to some fans the other day. I said I would have gone in making it sound better. I don't. I would not have. Every coach <laughs> I've been around would do that a little bit, but, but not Sam. But and, do you think he is being a little bit more PR conscious because – Practice is closed now, from now and, and throughout the well, season. Well, I think that's just being careful. I think, okay. he's, I think he's not wanting people to, us to see certain things. The other thing I would mention is, and this came from Petrino, he was trying to, in that scrimmage, he was trying to figure out what his playbook is going to be. He's got this playbook. Yeah. It's big. Okay, what actually works? What are... It, they've been experimenting with different pla pass plays, and it really was a passing scrimmage, not, yeah. not much running involved. Right, there was like 130-plus plays, and they were he heavy on the pass. Heavy so. on the pass, and what he was looking for, which plays, which routes, which plays is, does Taylor Green look the best in? What is he most comfortable with? What doesn't look good? What, should we, what plays should I take? and put on the shelf for a while and maybe we'll work on them as the season goes along and then bring them out later on because that, that's a process. So I think that was going on too. I think it was intentional. I think Bobby Petrino was intentionally dialing up plays that maybe they weren't comfortable with to see if they'd gotten any better and he was throwing the whole thing out there and then he's gonna go back over after the scrimmage is over, look at the video and go, okay, put this, take this play out Take this play, this one works, this is good. And to be honest with you, I think what happened last year, based on what I saw when the season started, was that your offensive coordinator did the same thing, but mm -hmm. I think he uh, misjudged whether or not those plays would work because we kept <laughs> seeing these runs to the outside yeah. that would take forever to develop. And the whole left side of the defense or the right side would be out there waiting. Hey, you're coming this way? Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> it was like, that's your idea of a play that would work when what I saw early on was quick hitting off tackle plays tended to work better than a long, mm -hmm. drawn out thing. But we kept seeing these plays where he was trying to attack the edges. And yeah. we saw it in practice a we, lot, too. Yeah, yeah. They, they were doing, throwing a lot of screen passes when, when, it, when it first started, and it didn't look good. And then they just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Well, here's Petrino looking at it in the scrimmage going, eh, eh, Ooh, this doesn't whittle work. it down, yeah. We, we won't do that for a while. I like what <clears> he <throat> said. It was my favorite thing that when we got to hear from Petrino last week for the first time where he talked about developing their identity, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of fans go, what do you mean develop? You should know your identity. No, that's what no. that's what practice is for. This is what fall camp is for, is that we've started with all of these plays. And then we've gone, do, do, do do, every, here's our identity. Every team is different. Yes. And you've got yes. to figure it out. And doesn't mean we won't incorporate some of that other stuff. It just means this is our core right identity. Now. Exactly, right exactly. <laughs> uh, Mousetown wants to know, did Pittman seem depressed to you after Thursday's scrimmage? His body language in that press conference looked to me like he's expecting another bad season with no blocking and no offense. Okay, that's the other part I referred to. <clears throat> When Sam Pittman was an assistant coach here, <clears throat> I don't know what's happened to my voice. Oh, so yeah, it's going poor away. thing. But when Sam Pittman was an assistant coach here, he would, the, our press conferences were right there off the practice field. Mm. 
and we were down in what we used to call the dungeon on the bottom floor of that Fred Smith Center. And so he literally, the coaches would be walking just down a hallway and then they were in there talking to us. Sam Pittman would always come in there. I mean, the guy was then, even then in his mid-50s, a little bit overweight, been out in the heat for two or three hours. He would come in and sit down, take his shoes off, and tell us, guys, I need to rest here a little bit. I'll tell you when I'm ready to go. And we would respect that because there were other players in there, other people to talk to. And we'd just be going talking to other people. And then he would be back there and he'd say, okay, I'm ready now. And we would talk to him. He, do, he d doesn't do that now. Yeah. He just walks right in there, stands up on that podium and makes a little statement. And it's usually pretty short. And then they start hitting him with questions. In this press conference, what? Mousetown saw as him looking depressed. <laughs> I saw a guy that was wiping sweat off his forehead constantly and trying to get his thought process together. Yeah, that's what I saw too, full disclosure. I said, he looks like he has been out there working with those guys. He looks like he has also been out there for two, what, two and a half hours and, and sweating out there with them. I also, I don't know if people have been out in the extreme heat in Northwest <laughs> Arkansas. Some of the people who watch the show live in Texas, New York, different areas. So they may not know the extreme heat that Northwest Arkansas had, had gone through over the past few weeks. But man, I, we stepped outside the other day and I was delirious. I was, I, I was only out there for 20 minutes and I was going, oh, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> so I played golf that same day. Yeah. I was supposed to do a bunch of errands for my wife that morning. So I come in, she immediately starts hitting me with a million questions. You go to the social security office, you do this, you check with this guy, did you call this guy on the phone, did you check at work about what? And I'm like, whoa, stop. I'm going upstairs, I'll be back down in a half an hour and I'll answer your questions then. You go, okay. I go up, throw water, all cold water all over my face, lay down a little while get up in about a half hour and come down and answer the questions. I was not in a position to deal with a bunch of dang questions because I was, my brain <laughs> and, was fogged. And, and that's from just your wife, not a room full of that's reporters right. asking questions that, that you need to know. I mean, some of the questions, like when he was looking at stuff, he was like, I don't have the stats on me, but Kyle can ask you. I mean, guys, he just got done <laughs> and just straight in there. You gotta give the man a, I think he should take a little bit so of time. So here's a suggestion. Okay. Why don't they, build this in now it's over now so it doesn't matter but to, for next year uh schedule that press conference about a half hour later it doesn't matter to us when no, we do it no. th those guys are in there working anyway They've, there's a media workroom down there and they're in there working and they could do the press conference whenever it says this is when it will happen yeah so give him a half hour there's a locker room that the players use right up the hallway let him go up there Take a cold shower, yep. get his, get his <laughs> thought process back together, have a change of clothes up there, let him come out there and look like it. We were just watching his uh, his appearance at the Little Rock Touchdown Club. Yeah, it was he great. Was, he was terrific. Great, yeah. You know? Yeah, he wasn't didn't look distracted. depressed. <laughs> he wasn't look depressed. depressed. <laughs> he looked fine. He was making jokes. He came, what did, tell, what did he do with the tie? So he wore the same tie as he did last year. He said he discovered that. He discovered that. And so when he got there and got up there, he said, look, I don't want it to happen. I don't want the bad juju of last year, right? So he, got, he went down off the stage, took the tie off and said, so I'm taking this dang tie off. And it, See, was, it was great. So that's Sam Pittman, the guy that with, with plenty of time to talk, mm -hmm. he's not out there sweating no. in the heat. He, and, and so if we saw him in that setting, I don't think Mousetown would be saying he no. looked depressed. I don't think anyone thought he looked depressed today. Unless, hey, let me know in the comments if you thought Sam Pittman no, looked he depressed. Was, <laughs> he was making jokes and, and he looked fine. He, yeah. I, I didn't get the impression he was worried about the scrimmage. And I believe it was Travis Williams when he walked into his press conference last week, I think Wednesday of last week, he goes, guys, whoo, it was hot out there. Sorry, I had to take a quick shower. Yeah. I think he even it's said smart. that to us. So he... You can do that, Sam. It's okay. We won't judge you. You can do that. Uh, TN Rich asks, does Sam Pittman get fired if Arkansas finishes the season with a 4-8 and eight record? Could Bobby Petrino potentially improve Arkansas's performance if he were to take over as interim head coach after the Tennessee game? Okay, this is the thing that keeps coming up. These Every week. These people that believe that he's fired by October. It's, Co some yep. people think it's after the, after it's the, the uh, A&M game or whenever they think it's going to happen. Here's a question I would like to ask all of those people. Do you think 
that Bobby Petrino would do a better job of running the offense if you took what he's doing, his job, and then dumped a bunch of other responsibilities on top of it. I'm going to say, no, I don't think so. Do you, if, no. If the, if the issue here is to turn the offense around from last year, because that was the biggest problem last year. So he's trying to do that. You think it's going to help to take him and say, no. oh, and now you're going to be doing all this other stuff You too. have to do NIL, you have to do yeah. all this, yeah. And he's already said that's what, what he doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. He's giving these little clues without, I don't think he wants to come right out and say it because it would be embarrassing to Pittman, but I think he's dropping these little clues. Hey, I don't want to be the head coach. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to run this offense. I like it. And uh, leave me alone. Let me do it. He there said that last week about talking about NIL. They said, you know, what, I, I can't remember the question, but it was something about handling NIL. What is your role in handling NIL? And he said, I don't have a role. Sam Pittman and Hunter Yurchek take care of that so I can coach, yeah. so I can focus on the offense. And you pointed out to me a few minutes ago that if that were to happen, and I don't think either one of us think it will. No. It wouldn't be Petrino. I don't and, think it and, would and be. And there's a reason why you have a co-defensive coordinator because if you take the, the, see the, again, people don't get this. They say, okay, I saw this happen. I saw this happen when Jack Crow got fired. Okay. And they took the defensive coordinator and made him the head coach, the interim oh. head coach. And he tried to stay on as the defensive coordinator and it didn't work. You can't do both jobs. That's mm -hmm. hard. So. What would happen is you'd move T. Will into that slot and yep. you'd still have a guy that you could move up to defensive Absolutely. coordinator. So, but, but I don't think either one of us think that's going to happen. Here's my view of what's going on right now. And see, it doesn't matter what I think, what anybody else thinks. Only thing that matters is what goes through Hunter Juracek's mm -hmm. head. Yeah. And this is what I've been told is going through his head. He likes this staff. He likes the, uh, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator. He likes the interaction between the head coach and those two guys because they have both said, hey, we like working for him. Mm -hmm. He lets us do our thing. We have input into the decisions that are made. Okay? So they like that. They, I don't know your check likes the way that worked. Now he goes around talking to all these players. You see this thing the other day where they were, players were coming off the field and they said, what's your favorite phrase? Of, of Sam Pittman, and they were all saying. Oh yeah, that was they were, great. Each one of them had a different thing, but they, <laughs> this isn't a, a bunch of guys that don't like the head coach. No. This is something fans like this never know because they're not around these players. The players don't dislike this guy. Uh, not even the, the recruits don't dislike. They this weren't guy. even that mad. There were some <laughs> issues last year with NIL, but this is a guy that's a player's coach, going all the way back to when he was an assistant coach. Players have always liked Sam Pittman because they relate to him. Correct. And they still relate to him. So Hunter Juracek knows that. Now, here's the final thing that Hunter Juracek knows. When you're trying to rebuild something, in the SEC, you don't do it overnight. It may not even work the first year. It might take two years. If, here's Bobby Petrino, one of the best offensive coordinators out there. When he took over that job the first time as the head coach, he had a losing record that first year. He was trying to get this thing going. Came back the next year, and over the next three years, they won 30, 29 games in three years, almost 10 games a year. 11 games is last year. So it took him a year to get it going. Hunter Juracek knows that. Might take Bobby as much a, a, a job as it is to turn this offense around. You brought in a new quarterback. You're working with him. Mm -hmm. This might have something to do with this rumor we keep hearing that Taylor Green may be back for a second year. Ah, uh, yeah. You're, you know, because he likes working with this guy. He feels like he's a long pro. Everybody these days wants an instant correction, and it doesn't work that way sometimes. Yeah. Even good coaches don't. If, if the problem you're starting with is a big enough problem, you don't solve it instantly. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. So I don't know what we're talking about here. But I do believe there'll be some improvement this year. I mean, if it's six wins, yeah. seven, whatever it, it, it is, I think Hunter Juracek has the attitude, okay, that's a step. Yeah. Then there's going to be a next step and a next step because the alternative to that is to keep doing what they've been doing, which is we have a coach here for four or five years, doesn't work, get out. Yeah. Bring in a coach here for three or four years, get out. 
bring a coach in here for you, get out. Well, you At have, some point, you have to stop that. You have so many other things that, to deal with than just coaching, than just being a purely good coach, right? Because you also have to deal with the transfer portal and NIL. And those are two factors that there are coaches who are great coaches that are still trying to navigate those two things, that navigate this new world of college sports that we are in right now. And so, hey, you might get some instant gratification, but you have to have money to do it. You have to have enough money in, the, in, in NIL to throw at great and, players. And they're trying to build that up. I understand. But the, to the people that go out there and say, oh, I want it now. Uh, give me a good coach and it'll fix everything. Uh, I got news for you. No, that's not how it works in this day and age. It's not. It is not. You need to have resources to help you. It's what Coach Cal said. Winning a championship is not just about having good, good players and a good coach but it also takes resources and the backing from an administration that, that wants to help too. Right. So there is a lot of other things that go into that. And that's why I'm like, I love this instant gratification world that we're in, but we got to realize it's a different world than five years ago, right? right? So Pig's Feet says, I've read articles about Pittman being on the hot seat and that his replacement is Coach Petrino. Is this even a possibility based on the fact that he could only be hired this time in a position where he could neither hire nor fire employees? Well, that's a rumor. Yeah, we don't know it, that. Because yeah. it, and I have been saying it because that's what I was told by somebody that I believe knows exactly what's going on over there. And the way this started, when Petrino's name first popped up before he was ever hired, I was talking to this guy and he said, look, he got fired because he hired his mistress and then gave her a job that other people that had applied for that job were better qualified than she was. That's an absolute no-no in an academic university environment because it produces lawsuits. If I'm somebody that applied for that job and I had a lot of uh, qualifications for it and I didn't get it and I found out, well, the reason you didn't get it is because he hired his, his mistress, then you can sue. Yep. So they were worried about that, so they fired him. The guy told me that when you get fired for an offense like that, there's no coming back. They don't rehire you. They, they don't go out and say, okay, you've been to uh, rehab, we've, we've sent you to counseling, and now you're not going to do that anymore, so we'll hire you back. He said, they just don't do that. So that was his reasoning for saying, telling me this rumor about Petrino coming back, he's not coming back. And there was, it was in Arkansas policy as well. It that's was what, written in the school what, policy, so right. was there in, was something stated yes. in writing and school And that's policy. what he was telling me, is that, hey, he's not coming because they can't hire him back. So the morning that the, he, he, they announced that he was coming back as offensive coordinator one afternoon, that morning about 9 o'clock, the guy called me back and he goes, oops, and said, it looks like they're going to hire him. And I said, I've been telling people he's not. And he said, yeah, but he said they did something that I didn't think about. They approached the people that had, they had to get approval from mm -hmm. with this notion that we're not hiring him in a role in which he can hire and fire people. All he does is work with the offense to get it better. Mm -hmm. He doesn't hire any of the coaches. He doesn't hire anybody. And, and therefore, he can't fire anybody. So therefore, what he got fired for can't happen in this job. And he said they convinced him. So that's... That's what I heard. Yeah. I don't know that that's true. Yeah. No one's, there's no, been, no, there has not been an official announcement. No. But I don't believe that if they decided, and I still don't believe Pittman's going to be fired in the middle of the season yeah. or whatever, but if that happened, I don't believe Petrino would be the head coach. I, you, I told you off air. I, t I told you, I said, I think you have it already set up based on what your coaching staff looks like right now. Move Travis Williams up. Make Marcus Woodson the, the defensive coordinator. Let Bobby still be OC and work because on the offense. Because that's what he wants to do. Yeah. So I think there you go. Uh, the Hawk Hawkins wants to know, is Coach Pittman being too cautious with these injuries? It looks like the most are very minor. Wouldn't it be better to let them get hit in the scrimmages so that they'll be ready for Oklahoma State? Well, that's really what the season opener is for. If you've had somebody that's been injured in their back in time for the uh, season opener, you, you got to hope, okay, you get enough playing time in that game to kind of get you going. I don't see any evidence here, though, that he withheld any of these guys for no reason. I don't think he took a look at Andrew Armstrong, for instance, and said, oh, he's too valuable. I'm, I'm going to hold him out. 
I don't think that's what happened. I think you've had some guys with things like turf toe, yeah, maybe yeah. an ankle sprain. And you said pit, concussions as well. Some were dealing now, with concussions. Those you have to. Yeah. There's no choice. Well, I'm just on saying, that. but you know that was he said right. all of those. Yeah. But I think some of these injuries are relatively minor. He said some of these guys could have played if the if the game had been that week. But with those, I think he took the attitude. I'm not just going. I'm not going to take a chance on it getting worse. Yeah. We want them to get better. But I don't think there's evidence to suggest that he just intentionally withheld people just to avoid possible injury. No. I don't no. think anybody's that confident. You've got to you've got to have guys go through some of the process just so they'll be ready for the well, first game, if, second game, if or he, whatever. If he was doing that, I mean, he might have held Landon Jackson in exactly. some of these, right? I mean, Landon exactly. Jackson, <laughs> that's didn't. arguably your best player and on he, your entire and he, team. And he didn't. <laughs> so I think we can conclude that they were hurt. You maybe could argue that if he says they could have played, well, then you should have played him in the scrimmage. But I'm not going to argue with the fact that he said, I just decided it was worth it to hold him out mm -hmm. and let him get completely healthy before I put him back out. I there. don't see the problem with that either. So um, I think that's being smart. MS Hog fan wants to know, which freshman do you expect to get serious playing time this year? Okay. The first one is not a typical true freshman. You wouldn't think of oh, him. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about you here. You wouldn't think of him as, <laughs> as a true freshman because he's 29 years old, but he is a true freshman. And Monte Harrison will play. Yes. He was starting in this last scrimmage because of, of the injuries to the two wide receivers. He's, I mean, Sam Pittman has said he's going to play. Bobby Trino said he's going to play. This guy is probably wins the award for the biggest surprise from last spring to now because he just popped up one day on the you know on, on Twitter or whatever <laughs> somebody I can't remember who put it up there hey he's there Arkansas is getting this guy that's a ex-major league baseball player he's coming as a walk-on because as a part of his major league contract he got his college paid for when he decided to step step down from major league baseball and that's how they're able to do this yeah. and I thought okay maybe that'll work out and I had no idea it was going to be this well, we even said when it was first announced, and go back to that, ask Mike, when we talked about it, we said, hey, this is just great because you're not using a scholarship on him. He's a walk-on. He has his college paid for. You know, if he adds anything, great. But what he adds is just experience, being a leader in that room, being 29 years old yeah, and playing pro baseball. That's about the leadership. But, but this, I think he's going to be more than but that. But if, if you watch that video of him in the baseball game climbing the wall to rob the guy at the home run, that you was, know he can jump. Yes. He can leap. Yep. He's fast. Yep. And he's tall, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, yep. And he's like 2, what, 2'15", yeah, something, yeah, something like, like that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. So he's a big, tall, physical wide receiver. And by the way, if you start looking at this wide receiver room, you're looking at got all kinds of different kinds of receivers. They've got variety there. they got... They got fast guys. They got short, fast guys. They got tall, physical guys. They got tall, fast guys. They got, <laughs> they got all kinds of guys. And they already had everybody coming back that caught a pass in a game last year, right. but they've added to it. So I just, I think this is, sets up perfectly for Bobby Petrino. He needs receivers. Oh, yeah. And he, he does. uses them. There, he's not the okay. only one, too, because I know you're going to mention. Yeah, well, now, other, a freshman played Braylon Russell. I mean, yeah. We don't know, I don't know if he may, he may have been asked this, but I didn't hear it if he was. I don't know if Bobby Petrino has talked about how much he ro is going to rotate the running backs. Yeah. But I assume that he will. Yes, I, I think, but he did mention Braylon. Yeah, three he, of them are and he did play. mention Braylon Russell well, Braylon as well. Russell, I think, will play a lot. Yeah. I, I think he'll be utilized. There is a true, fre this is really unusual, but there's a true freshman cornerback, Selman Bridges. He's been working with the second unit. Mm -hmm. But he, because of that position, cornerback, where they rotate because they want to keep people fresh, and he's got enough talent, I think you can conclude, based on what he's done in camp, that he's going to get some playing time. Yeah, he's tall. Yeah, he's <laughs> I notice he, he stands over some of those uh, other corners. So those are three guys. All of them are true freshmen. All of them, I think, are going to see some serious playing time this year. Absolutely. I'm excited to see what all of them will do this season. Pork Billy says M. Robertson or, or Robinson, M. Robinson, sorry, That's cannot Marquise. say that, Marquise, Marquise. Robinson, uh, Marquise, uh, he's a transfer at DB, appears to be a media fave suddenly. He's a senior, sounds a bit chippy, maybe a lot chippy. 
What got my attention was his former team putting a whooping on Oklahoma State last year at Stillwater. Yeah, okay, so he's a transfer from South Alabama. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he is. I don't know if chippy's the right word. He's got confidence. Oh, I like him. He's great. He did miss the first scrimmage, was banged up a little bit, but came back to second scrimmage and had a really good scrimmage. That's what got the attention of everybody, and he was being interviewed by the media. And he did talk about that Oklahoma State game. And he said, what I've been doing is t telling my guys, and he's talking about the other, I'm sure the other secondary guys, what they like to do and what we have to do to stop them from doing it. And I hope I'm a headache for them for the second straight year. He did have an interception in that game. Yeah. That game just, you know, I looked at that score 33-7 to and, and realizing that Oklahoma State won 10 games last year, I'm going, what is that? How did that happen? So I called up Jason Carroll, our former oh, yeah. boss yeah. here, who's now over there covering them. And he said, well, and I'm not an Oklahoma State guy. Who, who's the big Heisman guy over there, the running back? What's oh, Ollie it? Gordon? Yeah, Ollie Gordon. Yeah. He said he wasn't established as the starter at that point. Now, mm -hmm. you can think, of how did that, why yeah. not? You know, if he yeah. was that good, but he wasn't. And he said, then we were rotating, uh, they rotated three quarterbacks in that game. So uh, apparently Oklahoma State was finding itself in that game and found <laughs> They were finding their identity there, in that there, game. <laughs> there were some things that they didn't like, so they made some changes and it got better. My, the, I bring that up to point out that I think it's going to be a little more difficult for, for Marquise to do what he did last year, this year, because I think he's going to run in. I hope he understands he's going to be going up against a better Oklahoma State team than the one he faced last year. The Bionic Pig wants to know which fan base and boosters have the least capacity for patience with their new head coach? Ooh, this is a good question here. So the three that we're going to go with, I think the three that we're deciding between is Texas A&M football, Mike Elko, Alabama football and Kalen DeVore, and Kentucky basketball and Mark Pope. Well, on the surface, DeVore's got the the biggest issue there because he's replacing probably the greatest college football coach ever. Who yeah. would want to be in that position? No one. <laughs> Except him. <laughs> Except him, yeah. So, but then you have to conclude that, that Alabama fans are so delusional that if he doesn't win a national championship, then that means he's not worth, he's worthless and we're going to get rid of him. I don't see that happening. I think he will get a grace period where they adjust under him, and he may not need it. Alabama's got the, I mean, Saban didn't leave the cupboard bare, so yeah. he's not starting from scratch. And he also has all of the Alabama brand to go with it, right? right. I mean, you, you, it's Alabama. It is a brand itself, too. So, so I, don't, I look at that, and I think, nah, I don't see there being an issue there. Okay, then I look at Elko. Okay. Here's, the, here's the thing about A&M. They have really weird, unrealistic expectations. They always think they're going to win the national championship, and they, and they a lot of times they finish <laughs> seventh in the SEC West. I knew you were going to bring that up. Which sometimes happen. However, they don't have a history of running around firing coaches left and right. They tend to keep somebody for a while if they get them. So I don't see him having to come in and have an immediate huge impact. Now, he might have one, but I don't see him coming in and having to just tear it up in order to keep his job. Yeah. So that leaves us with Mark Pope. Yeah. And I'm going to go with Kentucky fans. That's what I, that's what I think, too. And here's why. <laughs> and it's, it's, we all know what this is. A lot of these Kentucky fans wanted Calipari gone. But guess what? They thought they were going to get somebody like, uh, not still Alabama's coach. Yeah. Might get Nate yeah, Oates. Yeah. Or somebody like that. Yeah, or and, UConn's coach, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, get, bring in the big UConn coach. Yeah. But see, that didn't happen. And I think it made them mad because now all of a sudden they think, okay, everybody's saying we, we a, a Hall of Fame coach quit. We yeah. didn't fire him and he quit and he went to Arkansas. And so they've started all this, he's not any good. Wait till you find out about how terrible he is. He can recruit, but he can't coach. And there, that's been going on ever since it happened. So here's what I'm saying. They want Mark Pope to succeed, obviously, but I also think they want him to succeed in relationship to, to uh, John Calipari. Correct. So he's got, he's got an additional issue. He not only has to win games, he's got to win more games. A than and he's got to get to the tournament, he's and gotta he's got to win a, in the he's tournament. He's got to do a better job in the NCAA tournament mm -hmm. than Calipari. Yeah. He's, got to be, he's got to be showing their fans, yes, we did the right thing, we hired you, and we got rid of this old doof that was over the hill. Uh, yeah. And so if that doesn't happen, 
I think he's in trouble first. I think he is I think too. From the simple standpoint that I think they thought they should have gotten a bigger name coach. Now, yes. once he was hired, they, a lot of them fell into place behind him. But I think secretly you would get a bunch of those people to admit, we probably need to do a better job. I wouldn't want to be the AD if he's in trouble. Look, look, look at how the fan reaction was when they hired Pope. That's what I go back to is the fan reaction of like, wait, we, we got Mar Mark Pope. That's, that's who we hired. Like that was the reaction of the fan base. And I saw that all over my feed. I didn't see the same reaction for Texas A&M fans with Elko or Alabama fans with DeBoer. Yeah. I didn't. And, I, and I've talked to Alabama. I have friends who are Alabama fans. Right. And they're, they're like, they're on the thing of like, we like him a lot. We think we'd like to see what he can do. You know, we, we know that we might not, we may not win a national championship this year, but we think he can do some damage. We think he has, yeah. we think he's going to do well. In completely different circumstances because Saban retired. Right, right. Calipari didn't retire. Right. He left and the implication <laughs> was, and, and, I'm Kentucky, you guys. and Kentucky fans, I don't think we're happy about that. Even though there was the part of the fan base that wanted him gone, I think fans were like, "Wait a second, you're going to Arkansas? Is that real? Yeah. Is that is that a real if he, thing?" If he'd gone some, I don't know, North Carolina, UConn, somewhere like that, maybe they, they, they might have been like, oh, "Okay." But yeah. a, but a rival SEC school and one they consider below them. Yep, that's that may have yeah. Absolutely. As Giles says, I saw where college, hoop co college hoops coaches think that Calipari was hands down the biggest hire after last season. Hog fans have to love it. Kentucky fans will hate it. Yeah, this was a poll that was conducted by a uh, CBS Sports. I think he's an online basketball writer. And okay. He said he polled 100 college coaches. And he said the choice of Calipari for, to, to be that biggest hire was equal to all of the first five, second through five combined. In other words, if you took the number of people that picked the second choice, third choice, fourth choice, or fifth choice and combined it all, it was still below Calipari. It would be like an election where you have six people running and one guy beats all of them combined. Right. You know. Yeah. I don't know what they call that, a pl plurality or something. Yeah, something like that, is. yeah. But anyway, so, and then he pointed out that that was perfectly logical because of all of the coaches that were hired last year mm -hmm. when the season was over, Calipari was the only Hall of Fame coach hired. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, and look, it, that's not only the biggest hire of last year, it's the biggest hire, I think, in the history of U of A sports. Yeah. As it happened. Now, you can say, well, yeah, let's talk about Frank Broyles. Okay, he was at Missouri, he had a losing record when he came here. I don't think anybody thought he was going to do what he did. So you don't know that. Uh, when Nolan was hired, he'd had success in, in mm -hmm. high school, junior college, and, and over at Tulsa. But I don't think anybody knew that he was going to come in here and win, two na win a national championship and go to three Final Fours. Yeah, well, I don't but... think he knew that. Do you think that when uh, John McDonald was hired, as a sh from, he was a <laughs> shop teacher in Greenland? Yeah. And the track coach hired him to, to do cross country. Do you think anybody back then thought he was going to win like 30 national champions? Was it 30, 40? Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. How many was it? I'm lost track now. It's 30, <laughs> We've 40. all lost track. It's like 30, yeah. Yeah, 30, 30 something national championships. I, I don't think anybody would have said that. So, yes, those were all big hires, but at the time they were not big hires. Mm. This is a big hire at the time because you've got a, a national championship coach who's had great success at three different schools or two, you know, one, two, yeah, three different schools. And he came here yeah. toward the end of his career. That, yeah. that has not happened before. No, I think you're exactly right. And the excitement that it's generated for Arkansas in the off season as well, just goes to show you how big of a hire it was. I mean, we're at SEC Media Days, Mike, and I said this on the show, what do people want to know about with Arkansas? Yeah. It wasn't about Sam, it was about Sam Pittman being on the hot seat and how do you like Coach Calipari yep. there? Yeah, that was it. Y'all, y'all, that that is what I got asked more than more than football questions was Coach Cal. So there you go. And the season's already sold out. I mean, they've yeah. sold out, right, of season tickets. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. WB Hog fan asked, please tell us about Arkansas alum Hunter Woodhall, who will be participating in the 2024 Paris Olympics. Well, he's got COVID. I know. He, he, he went online today and said, I have COVID. He said, it's my I'm fault. Sad. He said, I've been flying all over the place and taking risks that I shouldn't take. 
One of the reasons was he was at Paris to support his wife, Tara Davis Woodhall, who was a long jumper. Yeah. So he, you can understand why he would be there, but he said getting on planes and flying around all this puts you at risk with that. I don't think COVID is any near, anything near what it used to be because what he's talking about is it's the 28th is when it starts and he has it right now. He said, I'm gonna get over it and then I'm gonna be ready. Okay. So I don't know how much time he's gonna have to kind of get himself back in shape after being down with COVID, but he's expecting to bounce back quickly. Well, hopefully it's a light case. We don't know how he's feeling right. right now. I hope it's a light case where he gets to feeling better very quickly and can start training. But the good news is that he didn't. It is isn't August 28th and it's, you know, the Paralympics are starting in Paris and he has COVID, right? right. And he can't compete. So hopefully he will be good for for competition time, but we will be cheering him on for sure. We'll, we'll keep you updated on how he does. And Tara Davis uh, Woodhall, his wife, will be there as well. So yeah. uh, T.L. Slayton says, it seems to me the August practices are not as tough as they were back in my day. Two a days have been banned and coaches avoid the heat, which never happened to us. The worst was puking on the field. You don't see that much these days. Oh, I actually gosh. wrote a thing on my Facebook page rather lengthy this morning about two a days because this struck, I don't know how far back he goes, you know, I don't, I don't know what we're talking. He says in my day, I don't know what that really means. But here's what I would say. The practices probably aren't as hard, or at least they aren't as crazy, because coaches didn't know what they were doing back in those days. I'm serious. Doc, I went back and reviewed a lot of this this morning. And going back all the way to about 2010, all these studies were being released because you had all these deaths every year due to mm -hmm heat stroke, uh, all these other heat related injuries. You had a lot of injuries. A lot of, a lot of times people would be sick for days and then die. And uh, you had parents that went on a rant and they went on a crusade to, to lobby professional sports and college sports about this. Mm -hmm. The NFL banned two a days almost over 20 years ago. They haven't had a single death, heat related death since then. Mm -hmm. Now here's the problem with two a days. It's cumulative. They're the, the coaches told us back in those days, well, the more you do this, the better shape you're gonna be in when the season starts. No, you were in worse shape because your body was breaking down because what they didn't know was when you're working out twice a day in the heat, you don't have enough recovery time. Your body doesn't get back up. You have these little, little repair men that run around. Yeah. Every, that's what sleep is for. Yes. Every <laughs> night you go to sleep and the little repair men go to work and they go, I'm gonna fix this, I gotta fix yeah. that. Uh, and so if your system is in balance, your little repair guys get all the job done and then they, they're finished and you get up the next day. Well, with two days, that didn't work. The little repair guys were getting further and further behind every day. And, then <laughs> and they all were behind schedule. And then all of a sudden, and if you've ever had one of these heat related things, and I've had it, what happens is, have you ever had your funny bone? Remember the funny bone? Yeah, have you ever yeah, had that yeah. tween? Well, yes. And how oh, that feels, that nerve yes. thing? That happens in your head. Mm -hmm. Your head starts feeling like it's tingling and you're like, you want to throw up and you get sick and you feel stupid and you can't think straight. That's what they were doing to us. Yeah. The other thing was, and I still remember this, our coaches would say, they would tell you when you got water breaks. Now, nowadays, if you went over to the U of A and they're out there working on it, they got managers all over the place. All over, just student, yeah, student water, manager. water. Anybody wants the water, they run over there every time they huddle up and you can grab it if you want, yeah. if not, do it. No, we had certain water drink periods and you had to wait because guys, I'm thirsty. Nope, got to wait. That was totally idiotic. Oh my gosh. Hydration is oh massively important. Now, we also hated those, uh, those pills, those salt tablets. And I've been reading about salt tablets and they're actually important. Yeah, yeah. Because as you sweat, you release salt out yeah, of your body. Yeah. So you get an imbalance there. So that they were sort of getting that right. Here's the problem. They gave us too many salt tablets and not enough water. Oh no, so you had an imbalance. So oh my it was just, it was ridiculous. But the worst thing was, <laughs> You would get sick, and here's what happened. The first time, and I, we didn't do two a days in junior high. We did it in high school for the first time. So I'm on the JV team, freshman. And so right off the bat, we're in the locker room, and one of these sophomores says, he says to us, okay, you guys, you rookies, if you feel like you gotta pu puke, puke through the fence. Don't puke on the practice field. Puke, go over and puke through the fence. And we're like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So we get out there. And they tell the JV guys to go down on the other end of the field. 
So we're down there and right off the bat, some guy <laughs> got sick, only he didn't make it to the fence. And we're oh, like, oh my no. goodness. Well then, it, the worst thing is the smell because oh. it, the, the, there's no wind blowing, yes. there's heat and humidity oh. and it's just hanging there. So other oh. guys are smelling that and then they get sick and they're running over oh, there. Oh God. So then later on we do this drill called over and unders. And it basically involves three guys and they start doing all these tumbling things back and forth and, and the problem with the drill is once it starts it kind of moves on its own you kind of end up somewhere away from where you started well the drill I was in we went right over where the guy had made a deposit earlier in the oh we, no we rolled oh, no. over that and so oh god so coach coach Willock who was from Clinton Arkansas he's a really good basketball <sighs> player Scott Willock is his son some people may have heard of him he played for Texas Tech but Scott Willock from, or Ted Willock from Clinton, Arkansas was our JV coach. And even though he's a basketball player, he was a football coach there for us. And he said, okay, get over there and get that stuff off and roll around on that clean grass over there. So he sent us over there, we're, we're, we're away from everybody and we were rolling around like, have you ever watched a dog try to clean itself off? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're rolling around <laughs> in the grass and trying to get this stuff oh, off and don't everything. don't tell me. And we got it off, but the problem is you don't get rid of the smell. Yeah. So now when you gotta huddle up, you're around all these guys and, oh, and they're getting sick. And vomit just smells so bad oh, in the does. heat. And so, Finally, we get through this first stupid workout, and we go into the, the field house, and here comes Coach Willock, and he goes, ah, I had your first uh, experience with chain reaction puking, I see. And so we never heard that term, chain reaction puking. One guy gets sick, another everybody guy's sick. Gets sick. Everybody starts getting <laughs> sick. So I'm talking to this guy, and he's Eddie Land. He didn't question me. I have a question this week, but yeah. Eddie Land, and I'm talking to him on the phone, after Arkansas's first spring, uh, August camp workout, yeah, about yeah. two, two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. Right? I told him I was there, and he's the first thing he says to me, see any chain reaction puking? <laughs> I said, no, I, didn't. I said, I don't think that's a thing anymore. I don't think they do that. So it's my way of saying, yes, the workouts were harder back mm -hmm. then, but they were stupid, and players are in better shape now yes, because they don't do all that nonsense and so they're not puking because they've got conditioning coaches that know to give them water <laughs> and to not, not make them go through two a days and run around and sweat all over yeah. the place so they're, they're not puking. And, and look, when it's too hot outside, sometimes they'll do practice indoors to, to, to when, help when them it, with those heat-related illnesses. When it gets bad, they, they've got all these formulas. They know yeah. when to send them indoors. Oh, yeah. They check the heat and the humidity index. And, okay, now we've been out here long enough, you're going inside. Exactly, exactly. So not one of those things were we were tougher back then. No, we were dumber. <laughs> we were dumber. There you go. We weren't tougher. We were just dumber. That's, That's I, right. I like ending that uh, the show on that note here this week. That's going to do it for this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.